Thank you. Uh, my name is Larry Carberry. I come from uh, Midland, Michigan, the Dow Corning Corporation. And I'm going to talk today about some uh, advanced uh, structural silicone glazing concepts. And uh, my, my co-authors, I have a, one of my peers, John Kimberlain, who was instrumental in helping me with this. And then my, my other co-authors are Charles Clift and Peter Hutley of a consulting firm, uh, Curtain Wall Design and Consulting. Uh, and, they're, and they're based in the US. So I'm going to talk a little bit about structural silicone and how it's used in, uh, in commercial high-rise buildings and just talk about some of the history and calculations of behind that. And then, you know, talking about the architectural challenges of today, specifically with uh, high-rise and super tall buildings. Uh, those happen to be regarding wind loads and seismic activities and, and how some of those things can inhibit the design freedom and the, uh, the vision area and the transparency of the buildings. So we'll, uh, we'll look at some of the, uh, the structural silicone and really put it under some uh, uh, finite element modeling and, and compare data to, to real models and, and looking at some of the, the challenges that extra high wind loads present to us and, and look at what happens under these uh, existing uh, silicone conditions and, the, and the, uh, the adhesive attachment that's designed. And then comparing existing uh, design to, uh, to new uh, unique designs. And then take a look at uh, the information through uh, actual mock-up testing, uh, through, uh, the, through stu structural testing. And then, you know, kind of summarize with uh, what does all of that mean with regards to design of, uh, of aluminum framing and curtain wall systems? And, uh, and then what, what's the process to take some of this uh, science and engineering uh, one step further? So we, uh, we look at... Uh, the, what is a structural silicone where we are attaching glass and metal panels to buildings with, with silicone materials. So Patronus uh, done in 1998, 1999 uh, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. So there's about 10,000 units uh, on this particular uh, project uh, using uh, structural silicone to, to attach uh, glass to metal frames. Also, Central Plaza in Hong Kong. This has been a long icon in Hong Kong, one of, one of the standards. And then, um, you know, Exchange Square in Hong Kong. This, this building was put up in 1984, so that's 28 years ago. And through the, the structural silicone attachment for, for the glass panels, the numerous amount of uh, typhoons and, uh, and weather patterns that have been through Hong Kong, a testimonial to time. And, and today, one, wor one World Trade in New York City at Ground Zero. This uses uh, four-sided structural silicone. And so we've gone through a long history and, and proven performance of this material. So when I talk about the history, you know, first thing starting for, based upon architectural design freedom, 1964, they wanted transparency in a total vision system, attaching glass to glass fins without mechanical uh, attachments. And uh, this is a, called a, a total vision system. And then and through 1968, you know, the ribbon window effect uh, to start to uh, give me the ability to take off the vertical fasteners and, and still maintain a four-sided support to, to glazing systems. And in 1971, there was a very first project where all four sides of the, uh, of the, the glass was, was attached with structural silicone. 1982 was the very first time that a unitized curtain wall had been put together with two-part silicone, and, and that building is in, in San Diego and still alive and well today. So, with all of this, you know, what's changed over the last 40 plus years? Well, the technologies of the adhesives have really improved, specifically with, with durability and adhesion characteristics because we've got uh, very unique and durable paint materials that are used on aluminum and, and the colors that are involved there to really enhance this design freedom. So tensile strengths of these materials have, have really uh, improved, increased. The movement capacity, because of adhesion durability, has been increased. Well, we also today, we, we have tremendous amounts of computing capacity in our, whether it's our, our cell phones or our laptops that, that didn't exist in those days. And, and the whole analysis through uh, finite element analysis in, in, in these analytical techniques. So, you know, today we, we, see, we see facades that give us smooth glass and, and, and the unique of structural silicone. In the future, we'll see it, it, as the, the tensile strengths and, and unique materials where we will have uh, point-loaded fixings uh, that'll, that'll replace, me replace mechanical anchors. Again, it, it's all looking at design freedom and how this concept is used. Architectural challenges of today. We've got 
a significant increase in wind loads. Uh, as the buildings have gotten taller, this, these increased loads, we've got wider, deeper, thicker aluminum frames. And we've got, it requires thicker glass, stronger glass. And now we've got larger curtain wall anchors attaching the, the walls to the building. So an increased weight of the whole facade onto the building. And of course, not to mention the building itself has got to maintain the, those loads uh, upon it. So we also see the architectural challenges of, of energy efficiency and the thermal code, specifically in the U.S., have limited the, to a 40% uh, vision area unless there's an alternate uh, method of compliance. So it's, uh, the, the transparency and the design freedom has been somewhat inhibited. So other challenges here is uh, increased uh, interior humidity, desired without condensation. I, I live in the world where we have snow in the winter and, and condensation can be a real issue, especially when I want to humidify a structure, such as a hospital or a museum. A and the buildings are built in extreme environments. You know, at first in, in 1984, Hong Kong was an extreme environment, but today we see these major structures in, in Las Vegas and Dubai and, uh, and also the very cold climates uh, of, of the north and in Canada. So. We see increased performance standards. 20 years ago, we had Hurricane Andrew in the US. And those increased performance standards have uh, resulted in uh, impact uh, requirements for buildings in, in typhoon and hurricane areas. And all the, main, all the maintaining the, uh, the architectural community looking for maximizing of, of transparency. So a key thing when I'm, when I'm talking about just, just to highlight silicone here, is this is what I'm talking the, the structural silicone here is, is what attaches the, the glass or the insulating glass panels or metal panels to the building. It has some very unique functions. It's a continuous thermal barrier around the perimeter of a piece of glass. Uh, air and water intrusion performance is, is unmatched by gasket systems. Uh, seismic performance. You know, I've got a, I've got a flexible rubber anchor that, that allows some flexure in an aluminum frame while the glass is maintained to be, to be uh, rectangular or square. Impact resistance based upon the, uh, uh, the, the hurricane and typhoon codes. Blast mitigation. All of these things are really excellent in, in the structural silicone. And, and, and the problem is, is, is as all these performance uh, criteria and these numbers get increased, the bonding is dimensioned according to the loads that are given. So the higher the load, the more the bond. And, and pretty soon we get excessive loads on buildings that require lots and lots of, uh, of, of attachment area. So, you know, and also we've got to make sure that we understand that the insulating glass units have the same kind of performance uh, because they are structurally attached. The silicone there keeps the two pieces of glass together. So they've, they've got to real fulfill all those requirements. So, Here's a photo of a piece of glass, 1,500 millimeters wide, 1,900 millimeters tall, and it's under a 3 kPa wind load. So there, there's pressure on this. And what's really important about this, I took this picture in 1983 with one of my co-authors from, uh, from CDC. And, and here, as you can see around the perimeter, we don't have an even distribution of stress because this, this, this behaves in a trapezoidal manner. So there's very little stress transferred into the corners. The maximum stress gets into the midpoints of the long span and the midpoint of the short span. And, and that's just the science of it, a trapezoidal loading behavior. And, and we've had recently some rocket scientists in Asia decide that, you know, telling people that this is just a flat plate and you can average it all out. And it's like, that's not true. So, I mean, it, it's, here, here's, the, here's the photo. And, and, and from these early 40 years of, of understanding this kind of behavior, we take a section of the load and transfer it back to the edge. So a section in here goes to the edge. Well, when I get down into the corners, there's very little load that gets transferred to the corner. It, it's just some very basic science. And, and this has resulted in a very simple equation to dictate how much adhesive needs to be on the back of the, uh, the, back of the glass. It's worked great for 40 years, and, there, and there's been nothing wrong with it. It's a true uh, testimonial of success. So when, when this pane is, is deflecting under load, the, the silicone here is behaving in both tension and shear to resist those forces while it's keeping the air and the water out and resisting thermal and, and maintaining an, a differential thermal expansion barrier between glass and aluminum. So it, it really is a very unique characteristic. So. 1971, the very first time we did a, uh, uh, the, the mock-up with all four sides, you know, pressurize the mock-up until the glass blows out. Well, if you look here, this is annealed glass. It's nine millimeter annealed glass. 
and, and back in the day. And we wouldn't do that exactly today, but, but this is what started the, the whole concept. And we look at the structural silicone and all, when I, when I look at ground zero today in New York, and I, and I look at these towers that, that surround us here in, in Shanghai, you know, it, it all started back then with somebody starting to do some testing because they had an idea. There was an architectural desire. And this building is still up today. This is uh, in Detroit, Michigan, a couple hours from my house. Uh, it's occasionally uh, to, to make a pilgrimage there and just go continue to take a look, but, but it's there. So I want to study this. You know, these high loads and these design freedom and is really kind of taxed this whole system in, in a way that let, let's understand this. So, you know, let, let's input into a finite element model, a geometry and a data set for material response. Um, getting, to getting a material model through finite element because these materials are not linear. They are hyperelastic. They are not modeled like glass and aluminum and concrete and steel. They change their modulus with strain. And, and here we need to get to, to model and understand the stress versus strain relationship of a joint and understand what, what the stresses are, how they're distributed within the joint. So, well, we, we draw up a model, and, and this is a basic test method to understand the physical properties of these products. And this has been around for, for 40 years. And so if we're going to model it, we got to make, if the model is going to work, we've got to validate that we can do the same thing in the laboratory, all right? Just a very simple test. I've got to model it. I've got to describe what, what's going on. Well, when I look at these materials, I'm going to show you a lot of some pictures of, of this type of standard joint configuration because that's, that's the block, you know, 12 millimeters by 12 millimeters by 50. That block pulled apart in tension draws these curves. And, and of course, 40 years ago, the, these curves only went to about here. And, and today, they're, 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 much, they're much better. That's some of the advancements in the technology. But the idea is based upon this method, this is where we design for the, the, uh, the building return period for the wind load at 140 kPa based upon this method. And so it's like, let's understand that when, when we do that, how, how does that really impact the joint? Well, with this particular analysis, we, uh, we put into the system uh, uh, tension data, shear data, biaxial extension to create a hyperelastic model of that joint. And then that joint, we've got a, the actual test results, and then we've got the, the, uh, the finite element uh, results. And say, okay, this, this is pretty close. We've, we've got a working model that is within a range because where we look at this material and where it works is down in this area. So let's understand what, what's going on. So when I take that joint and put it under my design load, and, and here I can see the shadow of the glass on each side, I keep, I, I generate some high stresses at the edge because silicone material is a non-compressible material. It has a Poisson's ratio of 0.495. It doesn't compress. So therefore, when it's adhered to a piece of uh, glass or aluminum and then things stretch, these are going to be the highest points because this part of these uh, mod nodules and, and elements are not able to move. And so when I look at something that's okay, looked at 0 0.14, we've got some peak stresses here that exceed that. And same thing if I double this, you know, my, my peak stresses are, are, are exceeded again. So I, I really want to start to benchmark my, my model in finite element on, on what's going on with stuff that I already know. So, Here's a new challenge, a real challenge. We got a, a building, 50 story plus building, positive 6.2 kPa wind load and negative 9.6. Glass size is typical module width of 1,520 millimeters wide, 1,900 millimeters tall. It's not monster sized glass, but those numbers dictate 53 millimeters of adhesive contact on the back of that glass. That's a lot. That means that I've got a mullion width of 140 millimeters and an architectural desire that he doesn't ever want to see any mullions. So here, when I look at what's going on, if this is my, my piece of glass and this is my aluminum and this is my joint that's 50 millimeters long and about 12 millimeters deep, when I put that under the load, I, I generate some, some really peak stresses up here, you know, 0.82 megapascals. But when I look closely, this is under compression. There's a lot of this joint that's not even working. And, and here, that, that's at the midpoint of the, of the short span. The midpoint of the long span, you know, the, the same kind of thing. 
is here when, I, when I've generated those, uh, when the glass is, is deflected out, uh, higher points even at 0.91. So wh when I take that back to my, my existing block of, of, of sealant, it's, it's, it's like that's the same thing as, as taking that existing um, joint configuration out to 0.47 megapascals for those peaks to understand where, where I'm getting those peaks. And so, you know, that, that rotation thing was really strange. So my, my co-author and I, we, we were sat, sitting down to brainstorm that, and, and we looked at, okay, if this is my glass and this is my, my joint, when I, and I, and I rotate that, I, I've got this, this fulcrum here, but I want to reduce that stress. How do I reduce the stress? I reduce the strain. So I'm going to make sure that I understand to, uh, to look at, uh, to look at this. So I said, okay, I want to have a trapezoid. And now I can change that dimension by the fulcrum right here. So when we model this, we, we put the same, we put it in the computer and, and made a trapezoidal joint design. And, and sure enough, as we put that out, I've got more of a uniform stress throughout here and I have lower peak stress. Same on the, the midpoint of the short, of the long span is I've got, I've got lower peak stresses than what I had before. So that is essentially the equivalent of taking one of those joints to only 0.35. So, you know, when I look at that result, when I have that traditional standard method of calculation, I've got, you know, essentially it's equivalent to one of my test pieces at 0.47, not 0.14. And when I monitored it and modified that joint to embrace that rotation of the glass, it was essentially one of those smaller joints at 0.35. So it's like, okay, well, we've, we've demonstrated on paper that, that this can improve the situation. It allows the glass to fr more freely rotate and uniformly distributes the stresses. Great, that's on paper. So let's go check it out. And let's put together a mock-up for air, water, and structural performance to the Miami-Dade, Florida Building Code. And, and the protocols, air, water, and structural, and then, and then these are the, the, the codes. And so we had these uh, 75, 100% of design load and 150% overload. And we checked out two different laminated films because we used laminated glass. And we used three different types of glass. Five millimeter with, with uh, 2.3 millimeter PVB, SGP, and then six millimeter heat strengthen. And and because we didn't have anybody have an extrusion like this, we had to form some brake metal so we could get these joints to look like this, to be what we modeled. And then we, we'd look at the deflections here, the glass in the center and the, and the frame at the top, midpoint, and bottom. And so, you know, the, the protocol is, okay, there it goes to positive load, it goes back to a set. Then it goes to a higher positive load, and then it takes the set. The negative load in a set, negative load in the set, and then to go to 150 uh, percent overload, you look at the set, and 150 percent overload, look at the set. You don't get these numbers if the thing would have lost adhesion and, and flown away. Well, this happened. All three pieces of glass were had this phenomena that we had the performance and the adhesive performance that it held on. Uh, we had less deflection with the six millimeter clear heat strength than the SGP inner layer. So it, it, it proved itself that it, that it worked. And, you know, so no time that I know of has anybody ever done this, you know, taking the, taking the, the finite element model, mocking it up to, uh, to talk about how am I going to maintain that design freedom. So impact on design, it, it means some new mullion designs. And the, so that the mullions can maintain their strength by being deeper, not necessarily wider by maintaining the, the adhesive contact. So the narrower mullions decrease the size of the extrusion. And here, you know, they also increase the daylight opening. So the design freedom can be maintained. So here's just a couple of examples of head-to-head -head comparison. You know, with a conventional design, which I don't want to say is bad because we've got 40 years of history that shows that, that that's good. But those stresses, if I want to improve upon those, I, I've got nearly 24% of savings in that aluminum system. And, and so there's a little bit of, of, of innovation for the, for the sustainability of, of the whole concept of using science and engineering to broaden the, uh, uh, to broaden the application. So, you know, with, with that, I'm, I'm going to wrap up here because, you know, what, what we've done and demonstrated is that we had an architectural desire. We've got these increased loads that have managed to 
find their ways into standard calculations and, and, and the way we do things, and it becomes unreasonable and unwieldy. So we, we looked at, just looking at the, the finite element analysis of the whole thing, validating, I, I make a model, validating the model with testing, and, and then devel developing an optimized model for an alternative design and design stress. So then I've got to compare it, and I've got to compare it on the computer, and then I've got to take it back out into the real world. So, you know, the, the computer isn't the be-all and tell-all, but it tells us if we can make advancements on what to go and then be able to uh, improve upon. So, that, that's what I, I wanted to talk about today, and, uh, and we're gonna, we'll have some time here for questions at the end, unless we want to have questions now. Okay. All right. So, so thank you very much for your attention.